Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Shea Station podcast. It is episode 122. We're recording this on Wednesday, January 4th, but you're going to see it the next day. I'm one of your co-hosts, Jack, a.k.a. Jolly. Joining me is Jerry Blevins. But as Kelsey Wingert says on Farm to Fame, today, none of that matters because we have a very special guest, the first ever two-time guest in Shea Station history, a friend of Ed in Pittsburgh. He ran the sausage race in Milwaukee, the cup snake legend from Wrigley Field. It is Steve Gelbs of SNY Acclaim. Steve, how are you doing? Thank you for joining us. I'm fantastic. I did not realize I was the first two-time guest, mm-hmm. so I'm really very honored by Pressure's that. Pressure's on. Um, we should probably start, though, by just correcting a couple of names okay mm. first of all it was bob in pittsburgh let's not oh, I say ed oh, i blew it man he said ed. it was bob in pittsburgh and i want to make sure that he gets his due <laughs> second of all or secondly i think it's taken long enough for us to again correct the record on what happened this what you, summer what are you talking about and i um i may have accidentally on the air said that your name is Jack Olive and not Jack Oliver. Now, um, we got to figure out who the culprit is here because you did mention in the broadcast that you corresponded with my co-host, Jerry, to figure sure. this out. So what happened? Yeah. So what happened exactly is we were both correct. Interesting. Right, Jerry? We were both. So I texted, <laughs> right, I texted Jerry <laughs> and I asked, what is your actual name? He responded, Jack Olive, and then quickly said, Jack oh, Olive. Okay. So I texted him, and then I was like, that stopped at Olive. So I then responded immediately with Jack Oliver. So a fat and thumb I created had, this whole thing. Right. I had already <laughs> seen the Jack Olive. I went right with the information on air because <laughs> Jerry is such a trustworthy source, and I did not check the follow-up. So that's what happened. A yes. life lesson. Double check your work. It was it was one of those. Yes. Yes. A life lesson. You know, Steve, we all we are human beings. And Mm. that's what's your your vulnerability uh, on camera in the stands. Uh, What was the the gentleman's name in at Wrigley? Oh, the cup snake. Oh, Oh, the cups. Oh, like Jeremy or no, Jake, Jake, Jake. Yes. J- yeah. You and Jake became like friends. Do, do you guys still correspond? Yeah, Jake so. sent me. No, we do. Jake, uh, about a month or two later, I got a text from Jake that was a selfie with him with another cup snake. <laughs> and he turned it in, in the Wrigley bleachers and he just said, miss you, Stevie. So- <laughs> when did you guys exchange contact info? Just well, in the middle so of the snack? After, yeah, after the interview, he asked if I could send him the clip. And I said, of course. So we exchanged numbers. I sent him the clip that night. And for about a week, he was texting me, it seemed every morning because <laughs> he kept picking up steam. And it was on, I think it was on like the Today Show or Good Morning America. And so he would send me like rocket ship emojis and he'd say, <laughs> famous Stevie. Everything like was Stevie. stock. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he also uh, changed his Instagram handle from whatever it was, his name to either like Wrigley Jake or Cup Snake Jake or Bleachers Jake, something like that. So it was a big, listen, it was a big moment for both of us in our Extremely careers. Big. And I hope, yeah, I, I hope to reconnect with them at Wrigley this summer. I really do. I that would be great. You went out into the wild there, you know, you were in the middle of the pack, the middle of the snake. That thing looked heavy. So I, I was, I was very impressed. So I went out on a limb there and I think Jerry, you said it best on Twitter right after saying this could have gone horribly wrong. <laughs> <laughs> And it really could. I made a judgment call in the moment that um, our friend Jake was was a a happy person when he maybe had a couple of beverages. And he did ask me right before we went on. He said two things. Can I say hello to my family? And I said, sure. And then he said, can I use the word beer? (laughs) And I said, let's just say beverage. And I knew that if he was thinking that way, we were probably okay. I did make the mistake of not giving my producer a heads up that I had actually spoken with him before and felt good about it. So if you rewatch the clip, you see me really smiling widely 
And then my face kind of gets this dread over me because my <laughs> producer in my ear is just screaming, take the mic back. Who was it that was in your ear? Picker, Greg Picker. Oh, <laughs> Picker, Greg just, oh what are you doing? <laughs> well, that's again, that's that, that vulnerability, Steve. Like those are the things we were, I was in studio um, for that game and, and looking at each other like, Wow, this is a moment. This is one of those moments in the season, like baseball aside, that was a moment for people that watch the game that are a part of like the day in, day out grind of a baseball season. Those are the highlights I remember now mm -hmm. being on this side of things. The Cup Snake, Bob in Pittsburgh and that interview. Like I legitimately, your banter back and forth with the guys in the booth, those are, you bring such a fun element and your ability to go into the stands and find stories is is like an endearing moment during uh, a long grind of a season. Those mm -hmm. are fun. And, and like to me, it's an absolute highlight to see you do that and the ability to trust a guy like Jake in the stands and understand that in the in the playing it safe is smart, but also putting yourself out there because like it was like either going to be an absolute train wreck. Or yeah. what you got was glorious because it was, it, it went around, it went viral. He became yeah. cup snake Jake. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I appreciate you saying that, Jerry. And I think it's one of the things over the course of my career doing this particular job that you learn more and more and become more and more comfortable with. I think very early on, I was so focused on, you know, just really getting the stories and the trust and the baseball inside baseball stuff. And there is, a place for that. And that still is probably, you know, more of a percentage of what my job is on, on the ultimate scale of things, but especially in baseball, you realize that it is such a, a long season, such a grind. And if you take it too seriously, and I think our booth, our broadcast, and you know, now being a, a part of it as well, does a great job of, of recognizing that you can't take yourself too seriously, that this is still entertainment. And sometimes that entertainment is on the field. Sometimes that entertainment is in the booth. Sometimes that entertainment is myself in the stands. And especially when those games, you know, that game in, in Chicago, I think it was eight nothing or something at that point. Yeah, You have to find other ways. And for me too, one of the great opportunities that I have in my job is you get to bring people to other places around the country that don't get to witness these things. And the, the, most endearing part of Chicago and Wrigley to me is that that place, whether the team is 40 and 122 <laughs> or 122 and 40 is packed to the gills and is just happy, right? Everybody in the, in the bleachers, despite being down eight, nothing in a lost season was having a great time that night. And Jake, it became clear to me before I put him on, was a perfect conduit to show that. So, you know, that's that's kind of how I think and how the thinking has evolved. And, um, you know, I'm glad it comes through. Good. Yeah, Good I mean, hear. we were we were at the L.A. house getting ready for the All-Star game. I believe we were there during the 8 nothing game. And I think a couple people, we were either there or, like, getting ready to pack or whatever. And a couple people were like, why are you watching the game? It's it's 8 nothing. like, the game is over. And that was during the story. And it's just, like, those are the kind of things that can keep people's attention, even in a blowout. And... It's kind of it, it seems special to me because you can't really like plan for something like that. That's kind of just like you're not gonna like go find a fan in a cup snake and just have that kind of thing happen structurally. That is like sort of a, a magic interview. That's like kind of you just have to be in the right place at the right time. Um, but I, I wanted to ask you for you know the non iconic you know stories of the season. How do you just decide what you're going to report on? Is it like a day of thing? Is it something you plan out for each park? Are there certain you know research tactics you use for specific areas, yeah. or is it kind of always just whatever feels you know the most I guess fluid to you? Yeah. So one of the things, and again, this is kind of the evolution, and and it takes time to get there. Is when I first started, I would I would sit there for hours and hours before going to the ballpark, and I'd come up with a list of, you know, 10, 15 things that I wanted to talk to players about or, or pursue at a, at a different ballpark. And if I would get a story that I thought was worthy of, of going on the air, I would immediately pitch it. It has to be used that night. Okay. And, and it would almost be disjointed at times because mm. 
the thing about a live broadcast is you never know what the story is going to be that night. You never know what's going to make sense on any given night. And as I've become more, I guess, ingrained in, in the broadcast and have more to fall back on and, and um, maybe more confidence too, in what I'm seeing, what I know, what I have in my back pocket from years of experience. Now it much more is, find what interests me on any given day and and bank that and then whatever makes the most sense in the broadcast chime in on so i will literally be having a conversation with my producer off air hey keith said something that interested me i've got something on that open me up and that's how it kind of goes and the other thing too that i've learned is the best way to figure out how to best be used in the broadcast is to listen to the booth. Mm. So Gary, Keith and Ron, if you really listen to them, oftentimes, almost on a daily basis, one of them will say something that they're curious about. They'll, they, they'll just say, Oh, you know, um, I wonder what happened there. And I will then make a quick note and I will go find out that answer and we'll follow up on it. And so there's a lot of different things. It's, it's a lot of just, I guess, you know, it kind of goes back to the point, even with, with, the cup snake and you saying it's kind of a magical moment you just need to be open to anything right and have the confidence in your ability to to add whatever you feel is necessary and so um that's kind of how it goes and and it, it's very organic and builds on it and a lot of it too is just having and i'll go to the park and i'll have a plan but then i'll have a conversation with jerry blevins and something will will be triggered in that conversation that i wasn't thinking about and it'll lead me down a whole nother path it's really, really. I cool. love it. Steve Gelb's good listener noted. <laughs> That's the key. It's true. It's true. You don't want to be too rigid. Again, it comes with your your comfortability and in, in your role, um, because that is a mammoth of a booth to try to interject from the stands. Like I can't imagine. I know. Like when I came in and did the one game with it was just Gary and I, and had Keith and Ron been there, I'm not sure I would have said more words you know what i mean because i didn't i don't want to step on such an iconic booth's toes i would have eventually gotten comfortable enough to speak i know i was there for a reason i'm confident in in the things that i'm saying but you also don't want to step on toes and, and be like what's this kid doing now doing that from not even in this in the booth where you're you're out there i'm sure that was a, a learned process of being able to all right well this is worth saying or to be confident in yourself enough to do that. That's those are the fascinating moments for me. Your ability to 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 put yourself out there, be vulnerable in the stands, be vulnerable with the booth because they give you a hard time, and I love that that back and forth. And and you have a good self deprecating sense of humor anyway, so <laughs> it, it comes across as genuine. And I think that's again. This is my favorite part about about one of my favorite parts about New York and and people from New York is if you're in genuine, if you're not being honest about who you are, they are going to see through the BS and they're going to call you out. And just being yourself and being out there and being vulnerable it, it is eye opening. It's it's like you know one of the things I, I remember Alec Bohm saying he hated Philadelphia. Yeah. And then they asked him about it. He's like, yeah, I said it. I shouldn't have. I didn't mean it. It was in the moment. And just that that vulnerability, that endearing, honest, that's who I was. Uh, I shouldn't have said it kind of moment. Those things come across. And, and you, you've done an amazing job of putting your personality of who you are in, in a very powerful booth. And, and it's, it's, it adds significantly to me, uh, in my opinion, uh, to the value of the booth and, and the everyday watch. So that's cool. I appreciate you saying that. The, the key word, uh, and you said it, it's genuine. You just got to yeah. you know, sometimes easier said than done, but talk about the fan base being able to see through it in New York. Those three guys, the guys in the truck, they're able to see through it too. If you're not yourself. Yeah, those guys are, yeah. You know what I mean? If, just yeah. be yourself. Just be yourself and um, and they'll respect it and work and work your tail off. I mean, those guys, nobody works harder than that. You know, there's that's the thing. Nobody works harder in the business than Gary Cohen. Yeah. So you gotta, you gotta bring it. I mean, that's a fact. Is an update, right. So, uh, Jolly, I don't want to, I don't no, want to no. jump on top of it, but I want to follow up because baseball is going through some rule changes um, that are going to speed this game up. 
uh, shifts, no being all that stuff, pitch clock, uh, pickoffs, all that stuff. But there's uh, I think it's great for the game of baseball. I think the product on the field is going to be a much more watchable game. I think it's going to be enjoyable. There's going to be some bumps and bruises early on on the field. I'm curious is if you have thought about how that's going to affect your job with there's going to be less downtime, mm. less back and forth, less banter possibly, because I, I've talked to some of the broadcasters and they're not worried, but they understand it's going to have an effect. So is there something that you're doing in preparation or are you comfortable enough now to just be like, all right, we'll just figure it out because you can't prep for the unknown. Yeah, I'm, I'm. it's the latter. I'm comfortable enough with it now. I've thought about it, but I've thought about it, honestly, more from the perspective, the selfish perspective of I think it's going to make our jobs a lot easier because these games, they they drag. I mean, they just do. And so I think for everybody from the, the fans perspective, from the players perspective, once everything gets ironed out from the broadcasters perspective, a nice crisp, you know, two hour, 40 minute game is would be everything. And, you know, I, I do think that for certain broadcasts and certain broadcasters, it could become a, a significantly different um, beast to deal with. But the one thing that, again, it's just kind of unique to our broadcast. And it's, it's something that, you know, over time I had to get more comfortable with is we don't really have these set like, okay, here's a 30 second block that of time that we're going to go to Steve and we're going to get this report in the top of the third inning. It can be, I have something with two strikes and two outs. And if, if it's time, they'll come to me. And if there's an out made in the next 15 seconds, I've got to find a way to button it up and go to break myself. So there is a lot of trust there and you just learn how to, be concise when you have to. If you have some time, talk through it. If a play happens, I, you know I'm not a play-by-play guy, but if a play happens, I've learned how to how to call that play in stride and keep going. So I'm not as worried about it. But I do think it will affect some broadcasts that that are a little more. You know, our broadcast is kind of the exception, not the rule in that respect. There's a lot of um, formula to a lot of other broadcasts. I would say that that doesn't exist with us. And that'll be something that that I think people will have to adjust to. Yeah, Steve, you mentioned that, you know, the games kind of drag as the season goes on. I think that the the probably the quickest games of the season, probably just from an emotional standpoint, were, you know, the Mets long awaited return to the playoffs. It seemed like it happened in a flash and then it was over. And you guys were both there on set. And Jerry, I love that you brought up vulnerability before and honesty, because one of the key things I remember from the post game of the final game was Gary Cohen's candid honesty about how he felt about some of the decisions made and the overlook of the season and all that. I just wanted to, I guess, gauge your guys, you know, opinion on like the atmosphere of that playoff game, you know, seen, you know, before and after, because it changed on such a dime, obviously, because of the result. I mean, was it anything like something you had experienced before? Because I know you cover a lot of the Jets and the Jets have sort of had, you know, their struggles getting into the dance and stuff like that. Did it feel like you had to carry yourself a little bit differently with the Mets being in this do or die scenario? You know, this was, I, I am curious to hear what Jerry has to say too. This was a, kind of a strange playoff series, yeah. in my opinion. You know, when, when I, my first year was 2015 and that playoff run, that atmosphere was just crazy, just mm -hmm. electric. And, there felt like there was just such a momentum to it. And, and I think, you know, part of it was because of how that team went on that run. Right. So, you know, that team was not very good the first half of the season. Um, I remember they that lost lineup. Evans and it all fell apart. <laughs> and so, well, so it, you know, that first half of the year, it was not, there was not a lot of expectation. And then, you know, they make the trade for Johnson and Uribe and uh, the Flores stuff happens. They make the trade for Cespedes and Conforto gets called up and, you know, the, the Nationals just kind of let them hang around. And all of a sudden it became this magic carpet ride. And I think everybody was riding that momentum and nobody expected them to beat the Dodgers. And then they do. And then they sweep the Cubs. And it's just like, you know, built on itself. Right. This season, the Mets were so consistently great from start to finish that the way that it ended, the only real downturn 
came at the very end. And so it was the opposite going into the playoffs. There, the momentum was not there. There was this air being let out of the balloon, it felt like, based on what happened in Atlanta. And so it almost felt like there was this nervous tension consistently throughout that three games with the fan base. And even the way, you know, the way that started, there wasn't really a chance for the fans to, to get back on board, to get back into it. Um, and so it just, it felt very different. It felt off to me that, that was, you know, and I think it's a shame because for so many reasons, this season was such a galactic leap forward that it is a shame that the way it ended left kind of this, this soured, unfulfilling feel amongst the fan base and really amongst the players too. I, I just, you know, it, it's it's funny how things. You ask about the Jets, it's funny how things are. Where if this, if you told me before the season the Jets would win seven games and play a Week 17 game that mattered, yeah, hundred percent, you sign up for it. But the way that it started right. versus the way that it finished changes the entire narrative and feel. Uh, yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, that 15 run was magical. It was out of nowhere. There were supposed to be another two years before they were competitive and they jumped on it. So it was kind of out of the blue, whereas last year felt like they should be there. They were expected to win. And then Atlanta took over and we lost. And then like even like I, I'm very I'm not being critical of fans at all. But the atmosphere at City Field during those three games, especially game three, was less than I was anticipating. And it's not their fault. It's not. It just was the momentum of the season. And we kind of felt that um, lull. So that, that the what I'm bringing into this is this year with all of the expectations of the big signings, you know, eventually, you know, we'll, we're going to talk Correa because we have to but I'm assuming he's in the Mets uniform, but with all these additions that we've had, do you think there's going to be that f same feeling of unfulfillment unless we get to the world series or unless we win the world series as the Mets, or do you think there's still going to be that fun atmosphere? Because the team last year was excellent. They won 101 games. They got a Max Scherzer, uh, Jacob deGrom and a Chris Bassett start in a three-game series and it didn't work out but it was set up and it felt like a letdown at this point it feels like they're trying I, I'm I'm I don't want to freeze it like this but it feels like if they lose it's a letdown if they win it's like a relief hmm. versus the ecstatic nature of we're gonna win this you know like I feel like it's not less enjoyable but I'm worried that might feel that way so what are your expe expectations from atmosphere or do you have any? And I don't want to put you on the spot and try to make you say what you think the fans are going to do or disappoint, whatever the case may be. But I am worried about the overall feel of the team and, and the expectations around them and kind of feeling a little bit of a letdown. It's a great question. Listen, I think it's going to be electric at the start, no matter what. What, what they're doing right now I said it before, I'll say it, it's unprecedented. And from a Mets fan's perspective, it's everything that that you ever dreamed of is having this. It's any, it's everything any fan base has ever dreamed of. No fan base has ever experienced what the Mets fan base is experiencing this <laughs> offseason, ever. In in North American pro sports, ever, 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 ever. Um, so there's going to be electricity and there's going to be excitement, but there is an expectation now. This is no longer the plucky underdog. And so I think a lot of it is going to be de dependent on how the season plays out. I think last year, it wasn't even just that um, there was that letdown at the end. It was that the team opened up such a massive gap early on that it felt like they were collapsing to a lot of people, even though they were not collapsing. They won 101 games. It's just that another team in their division went on an historic tear. So, you know, if this season plays out where the Mets, the Phillies and the Braves from start to finish are battling to the end and the Mets finish in second place, I don't think it's going to feel the same as if the Mets open up a 10 and a half game lead early on and don't win the division again. So I think there's just a lot of factors, but um, but I do expect there to be a lot of excitement 
early on a lot of because how can there not be you know how can there not be this is that, a, an organization that is committed to winning the world series that's that's what, that's what i want that's what i want to see i want to see a fan base and i think i will i, I and again i i love mets fans they're some of my favorite moments it's why i've stuck around this organization with s and y i enjoy everything about it i want to reward the Coens for what they've done. I think I, as a fan base, you you're grateful because of what they're doing. Like you said, it's everything they could ever dream of happening. They're setting them up. They're not leveraging the future. They're doing it in what seems to be the perfect way. They they've gained draft picks versus, you know, losing them that kind of approach. Um, I want the Coens to, to, to feel the love and gratitude from the fan base as well. And for them to come out and have mutual appreciation because they're all fans of, of the New York Mets. Um, so I, I'm just super excited for the start of this season for spring training coming up. Um, I've never been excited to go to spring training in Florida before, but I think <laughs> Jolly and I might be, you know what I mean? Like Florida spring training is not my favorite. Guys, I, I'm excited for them down. Hopefully. Yeah, I think we're gonna we're gonna. Oh, that that's the great. that's the initial conversation because last year the whole crew, uh, John Boy, all went out to Arizona, right? Um, which is you know so centrally located, it makes sense. But now, you know, this is a this is a fun coverage of a, an amazing team, and so hopefully we get we get to cover it in spring training because it's truly like. I'm excited to be around this group um, to see what they've got, because I think they have amazing potential. They've got incredible human beings that with personalities to cover. It, it's a group of players that are very talented on the field, but incredible personalities off the field that are fun to cover and to listen to them talk. I mean, the, the fact that they brought Nemo back, listening to him speak, He's now, to me, in, in my view, he's the face of the franchise because we've seen him grow from a puppy, you know, into this thoroughbred. And he's he's we've watched him matured. We've seen the way he answers questions, the 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 openness with which he he speaks to the media and, and his his answers. Like, I'm very excited to cover this team. Yeah, I mean, I I constantly think back to the 2019 season before I was doing any of this. And that was a season with numerous blown leads and all time bad bullpen, you know, kind of pulling scraps from all around to make wins happen. I think it was an 86 win season. We came in third place. And I fondly remembered that as one of my favorite seasons ever a season where we were a winning team didn't make the playoffs, but I got to experience winning baseball and a lot of the magic that came from 2015. And I think for a lot of Mets fans, including myself, now if that 20, 2019 season happened under the Cohen regime, you exclusively think of that as a disappointment, a lost season, what could have been, all that. And that just goes to show how the mindset of the team changes, the mindset of the fan also changes. So Mets fans themselves kind of have to embrace that we're not the plucky underdog that Steve mentioned before. As fun as it was to be that in 2015, when you have a sustainable model, you expect a great product every season. And now the Mets are in, the, in a position to repeat that 100-win season that they had last year every single season. So I think that going into spring training, it's very interesting because I, I Jerry said this a couple episodes ago, but I'm under the impression that the Mets need to win the National League East this year. There is no wild card scenario where I think that you can have the fan atmosphere that you're wanting for that playoff game come back. I think the Mets need to prove themselves as the top dog in the East if you're spending like it, if you're trying to build a system that acts like it. And, you know, Carlos Correa, I guess we can finally talk about now, you know, 40 minutes into the show. Uh, <laughs> but we don't... Yeah, well, I wanted to ask you, you said something interesting. I wanted to ask, Steve, is there is there a benchmark for you that creates a successful season? Like, is mm -hmm. it, for a long time, those the Yankees were world series or bust. Like it was a failure of a season. If they didn't win the world series, yeah. I have my own personal feelings, but what, what are your thoughts? Is there a benchmark? Is there, yeah. I mean, they listen, they've got to go on a run in the playoffs. They yeah. have to. Um, I don't know if it's world series or bust is so it's just, it's so difficult, you know, like <laughs> you get into a short series and anything can happen you know, you, you build a team over the course of 162 to put yourself in the best position to succeed, get to the playoffs and give yourself a chance. But to say all the time it's World Series or bust, very difficult. But 
Uh, this team has to go on a run in the playoffs. And whether that's, you know, win the pennant, get to the NLCS, I think it's in that, in that, you know, realm. And again, as impossible as it is to say there is a World Series mandate, I don't think there is a World Series mandate. That is the clear goal, bar none, period, hard stop. That's it. You know, and that's, I think that's exciting. You know, there's very few franchises in sports, really, where that is it. Everybody strives to hopefully get there, but the Coens right now are putting everything behind this team to win this year. And I think what they're showing year after year is that's not going to stop. Yeah. If it doesn't happen this year, then next year they're going to do the same thing. That is where the excitement lies. So, yeah, I, but I think they have to go on a run. What's, what's yours? You said you have one? Yeah, yeah. I, I, you, you nailed it for me. I feel like the exact same way. It's got to be a run in the playoffs. It's got to build excitement. I don't want to necessarily say you have to win the pennant and get into the World Series, but you have to be on the verge of possibly winning the pennant. Again, baseball is really hard, unpredictable. But uh, you, you, you said my sentiments exactly. You, you put yourself in a position where in spring training, when the team comes together, you're not blowing smoke saying like most of the teams are like World Series, we're going to do it. It starts today with, you know, infield outfield. This is a legitimate <laughs> contender. There's like a handful of them every year. And this feels like they were a contender last year. I thought their roster was a contender in 2021, to be honest. And that's, I think, why it felt like such a letdown. And there was a, uh, a lot of things that changed after that. But I feel like with the Coens, now you're going to have every season, it, you're going to be in a position to say, we are a legit contender for the World Series. Whether or not you win that, those are those are – a lot there baseball is a lot of things going in but the look fact at the Dodgers that, right Dodgers have won one yeah, yeah. failure like this the, the Cubs that were that dynasty before won one you know the the Rays never won one but they they're always there yeah so I don't I don't want to put a benchmark but I I agree with you that they, they've got to put on a run build some excitement um, I think it's about get showing progress just in general I think you need to just show progress even if it's not more regular season wins because 101 is a massive total that you can't, right. you can't get that you can't just you like can't, bank that in right. but get uh, to and the i'm dance. not even i don't even feel like they need to win the nl east i said that i think a couple of a couple of episodes ago but again with the new playoff setup it's not about and the, even the way the the season is played out you're not playing the same teams as much over and over again you, you got to put a run in the playoffs. You got to make a yeah. run at the World Series. I agree. And I think just to, to button up that point, I know what you're saying, Jolly, about you got to win the division. This division is great at the yeah. top, first of all. It's the best one just in baseball. Is, right? Uh, second of all, to my original point, you know, 20 minutes ago or whatever, it it's such a long season and so many things happen that I think it's impossible right now to say, well, they have to win the division at the end of the year, because you could get, who knows, you could get massive injuries and they could be seven back out of the playoffs. And then all of a sudden they go on a, a run to sneak in. And that would feel in some respects better than the way that this season ended with 101. Right. You know what? It's just so many things. It's such a long season that it, I just think it's hard to declare right now what will feel good. I think they have to get in and make a run. However they get in, however they make that run, doesn't really matter. Just get in and make the run. My, my only counter to that, and I do agree with what you're saying for sure, is that I think, you know, we're getting likened to the Yankees a lot now. And I do think that the unprecedented spending is something that, you know, Yankees fans haven't even seen even during the Steinbrenner era. But the the signal to me always sits in the outfield rafters. Our, our banners up for, you know, wild card appearances and, you know, the two division titles in this century – the Yankees don't hang up those banners. They hang up banners when they win World Series. And I think that what I mentioned before about showing progress is before the Mets can, you know, they could go on this run without toppling their division foes and all of that. But I think mentally for Mets fans themselves, the Braves have run things in the East forever. You know, in the 2000s they did. In the 2010s there was that low where the Nationals were on top for sure. But now the Braves have built themselves another dynasty caliber team 
And you want this era of Mets baseball to be different. Even in the success of the early 2000s with the 1999 team and the 2000 team that made it really deep to the World Series, those were both wildcard teams because the Braves were in front of them. And I think to signal to Mets fans that it is a new era of Mets baseball under the Cohen regime, you got to take out the big brother. So I'm still looking forward most to seeing how the NL East race cracks out. Hell, it could be the Phillies too. They have a really formidable team now as well. But I think that is the first stepping stone for me as a fan to truly believe, okay, we are a perennial contender. We are a force to be reckoned with. This is no longer, you know, the Mets of the past that would trip over themselves and make foolish mistakes and questionable decisions. This is a team that means business and wants to go to the World Series and try to win it every single year. That was my little Fair. monologue. There you go. <laughs> yeah, I dig it. Yeah, you're. I like it. You have a you have a perspective, and it's valid. Like every fan, you're allowed to feel however you feel. Like you want to hang a banner. Well, you know, this I get is it. the Shea Station dynamic. It's the fan versus even, the analyst, even, you know? Yeah, that's what I mean. The the Braves have owned, and they've been the Braves have been counted out every year. They're like, ah, it's this is the Mets year, or you know what I mean. The right. Phillies are gonna, and then they end up. They've won it how many years in a row? I think since 2017. Yeah. So, and, and they, again, they'll probably be second or third even and on most analysts and they, they get to use that underdog. What is it? Plucky. I'm not even sure what that, <laughs> what that really means, but the plucky <laughs> underdog, uh, the Braves can use that as billboard fodder. So. All right. Well, I get, all right. Now we should really circle back and actually dive in on the off season before we finally let Steve go, because we, we keep, you know, talking about how historic it is, how unprecedented we should talk about the elephant in the room that I guess surrounds every podcast we do now, which is what's the deal with Carlos Correa? When is it coming together? There have been, you know, rumors all over the place about, you know, who has leverage, who doesn't, what's the communication. Steve, I just want to first, you know, gauge your impression of the off season, what you kind of viewed as like, the biggest moves of the offseason, whether it was Nimmo coming back or DeGrom leaving or Kodai Senga, anything like that. And then I guess, you know, ultimately ending with what do you think is going to happen with this whole Korea situation? Yeah. Um, so, listen, what, the first part of this when it comes to, to the offseason, you know, it's hard to pinpoint just one. I made a huge point during the winter meetings, though, about Nimmo right. and how critical I thought it was for them to bring him back. Uh, more than anything else, because if they did not, the drop off after that was so significant. I don't know how you fill that spot. And yeah, on the on the you know personal side, he's as good a story as I think exists in terms of what he's built himself into. He's as good a guy as you're going to meet. He's as good a face of a franchise as you could possibly have. Um, so personally, happy for him. Happy for the Mets fans happy for the organization that it all worked out, but just in terms of X's and O's on the field, um, I don't know how you could have replaced him this off season uh, if you didn't bring him back. So I think him, that him and Diaz, him and Diaz, yeah, him and Diaz, the guys right. behind them were like way behind. Exactly. And you know, I almost forget about Diaz, but that's the other element of all this is I think there was a, a period of time, you know, the winter meeting is only, three, four days long. And there was a period of time early on, even after they signed Verlander, where it very much felt like from the people you spoke with, well, they're not going to go much over 300 million. Mm -hmm. You know, Steve's been out there saying you should be able to win with $300 million as your payroll. And I remember just sitting there kind of doing all the permutations out and saying, this is strange to say, but I don't know how they win with a $300 million payroll. There, there were just too many things that had to be done. And I think it was after that Trey Turner deal, and you started to see all this money get thrown around in this term where the sense from inside that room for the people you spoke to was, all right, Steve just decided we're going to do what we have to do. <laughs> and once, once that switch was flipped, and I think it was the right one, like you, you've invested all this money already, you can't – do a half measure here. You got to go all in. That's where I think then you started to see the Nimmo and the Sanga and, and uh, you know, the Correa. And so, um, so I don't know. I don't know if that answers your question. Nimmo no, I think was the does. most important one. And then that also kind of, again, signaled where they were going to go, which is they were going to blow past whatever luxury tax was in place and they were going to put the best team on the field. Correa, 
where do I think it's going to land? Listen, by the time this episode airs, it might have already landed. True. <laughs> I think <clears throat> I think it's going to happen. Uh, that is total speculation just based on um, what I think makes sense for both sides and, and why I think we're not hearing anything. Uh, you know, I think if there were, were significant issues that were going to end this thing, you'd probably start to hear more leaks out and about in the media. I think the the silence is encouraging that you're probably getting two sides that are just working towards a common goal. I also think that from Scott Boris's perspective, uh, he knows that his big whale now is Steve Cohen, and he wants to maintain as great a relationship as possible with Steve Cohen. And so I, I just feel like, you know, even the Correa stuff on Instagram, I, you don't want to read too much into these things, but if it wasn't going to happen, I don't think that he's going to post on Instagram <laughs> a, a picture of his son wearing an I love New York shirt. I just don't think it happens. Right. right. Um, so I think that'll work out. And I, I'm I want to finish with this about once it does happen, assuming it does happen, the importance in my mind of that Correa signing. Uh, this team was great last year. This team also was, for the most part, inexperienced when it came to the big moment. Mm -hmm. And I remember vividly speaking during that Atlanta series with Brandon Nimmo before the first game in Atlanta, where he said to me, I have not been this nervous to play a baseball game since my first opening day. I was pacing around the hotel room all day, just anxious to get to the field. Pete Alonzo said something similar after the series that this felt different. I've never experienced something like this. And I think you kind of saw that both in that Atlanta series and in the playoffs where these guys were getting that experience for the first time and they were playing a little tight. Um, Carlos Correa has an excessive amount of experience in those moments and an excessive amount of playing well in those big moments. So I think as you look towards the pieces that are going to put this team over the top, adding a Correa to a mix of guys that now has that experience under their belts matters a ton. So I think it's not just the, the type of regular season production that he inevitably adds, but the type of big game, big moment production that is going to be so necessary to a group that has one mandate, and that's to win in October. Well put. Brilliant. I, I, I that the Correa deal took me by surprise, completely by surprise. Um, I thought the team was set. Nimmo, I like after all the signings, the the bullpen, Correa blindsided me. This was that was the one where I was like, man. Stevie Cohen, like this is what a joy, what an absolute joy. Um, and I think you nailed the, the, the reasoning beside the fact behind the fact that he is an excellent player. He's young. Um, I thought it was a big sign of him in Minnesota. They signed him to that big AAV and they're like, we need you to come back because of the way he shaped an organization, the way he showed that drive. And I think Steve Cohen was like, look, we need that edge. We need somebody that's been there before, that's still young and in his prime and good to push those guys that don't have that experience to say, hey, hop on my back. I'm going to lead you there. And then it's your time to also, you know, eat as well when we get to the table. Um, because it it did shine. It did glare their anxiousness and the uh, around that Atlanta series. And I thought it was a bonus that they got their butts kicked in Atlanta going into the Padre series, because now they're like, we've been, we've been there, but now that they've been beat in the playoffs, I think it might help the team moving forward. Much like when Edwin Diaz struggled when he first came over to New York, now he's a better pitcher because of it. I think all that experience and all that, lack of winning or just being in a moment like that because there's nothing like September baseball and when it's meaningful and then in the playoffs it's the best you can't prepare yourself for it as a player until you're there and you're in it and you get to experience it because you've got your head down and you're plowing through in a, a season 
because it's you got to be in your routine. And then now all of a sudden the pomp and circumstance of the playoffs happen and you have to be in the moment because your 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 routine's a little bit different because of TV, the fans, the atmosphere feels different. Everything's vibrating. You got a new patch on your on your jersey. Your hat's new because they had to put a patch on it. Everything is elevated. And a lot of guys for the first time are just kind of deer in the headlights looking around with those bright eyes. Um, so I think the Correa signing for a multitude of reasons uh, caught me off guard, but it showed me again uh, an appreciation for the owner that that's bringing that guy in. And ultimately I think it gets done. I, I'm interested to see the nuts and bolts of this contract once it's done, because the best thing about what Steve Cohen did with Edwin Diaz was he gave him his market value. He didn't bullshit him around saying, you know, we want you back. We're going to lowball you here because we know you, they didn't, he didn't use the leverage that he had against him. He gave them the respect. So I think there's a Correa and Steve Cohen and his agent and the union get together and mutually figure out what's best for the player, what's best for the team and they move forward. That's what gives me that's what gives me the most hope and understanding that I I feel this deal is going to get done and they're all going to be happy and, and Correa is going to be happy to be a Met. And, and because Steve Cohen has shown respect to the players and what they bring to the table. So I, I'm excited and I think it gets done. Um, I don't know I when because there's a lot of nuts and bolts in there that, that are unprecedented. But, uh, you know, I think it gets done. I agree. And I just I want to go back to one thing you said, though, about the the bright lights and how different it is. And again, I'm kind of curious for your perspective as a, as a player, um, Trevor may said something to me after that Atlanta series too, or during the, I don't remember, you know, it all blends together a little bit, but how in baseball specifically, it's really the one sport where no one game seems all that important during the course of the season where um, there are so many of them that it's so much about, stretches and runs and so you never show up to the ballpark as a player and feel like well we lost this is devastating this is over this and then all of a sudden you get to play off baseball and it is that way and so to learn to play the game that you're literally playing every day with completely different stakes like nothing resembling what you played on a regular basis is jarring for a lot of guys to go through for the first time. That's what he said. I, I mean, and it's kind of the point that you were making. Yeah, it is. Uh, for me, I enjoyed it. We did it, and Jolly has heard too much about the 2012 season where I was in Oakland. Yeah, the that 2012 run where we we did this. The, the Texas Rangers were the reigning back-to-back -back AL champ, went to the World Series two straight years. We chased them down at the last series of the year. And we dominated them. We knew we were going to beat them. They knew we were going to beat them. They lost the lead on the last game of the season, went to the, went to the expanded wildcard game, and got they got beat, I think, in Baltimore. Yep. We saw that dive because that momentum happened in the regular season. Those They weren't expecting, weren't ready for that kind of series at that point. And you saw the momentum swing. And so as a player, I remember coming to that ballpark in 2012 and and being around the guys and we were just it we hadn't played those meaningful games before and we weren't nervous about it we were excited for it and i think the expectations of we don't have to win because it's a success that we were there because we were the underdogs i think that's the difference that they felt i felt the 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 pete alonso pressure was I have to do something in this moment because we have to win. Whereas I think Correa is going to bring a new perspective of we're going to win. We're better than these guys. Like relax, just play baseball. Let these moments, these are the ones that you dream about when you're a kid, when you're, you're in the backyard, you're playing in, the, in a meaningful game. You're not just grinding out a season. You're not looking at stats. You're looking at a moment in a game. And so if you can just reset your brain and say, this is what I've worked my whole career for, my whole life for, is to play in this game. Like, this is fun versus this is nerve-wracking. I think that's the element that Correa brings because you can tell he's having a lot of fun. Scherzer, intense, 
you know, bulldog anger, head down, doing it. As a pitcher, they didn't have a position player to be that guy, and now mm-hmm. they have one. Well put. You guys, I could just listen to you guys talk all day. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is a, a beautiful friendship of, you know, that 2015 season was also my first as a Met, but, you know, I did I spent it on, on rehab assignment. You know, I've got the scar to prove it. Um, but, you know, we were around for, for the, the, the beginning of a fun little run that didn't end up where we wanted it to as a, as an organization, the lull back down, um, and then the changing of the garden where we are now and the expectations built forward. The beautiful part about it is I see a plan for the, like, it's hard for me to say When Illich, the owner of the Detroit Tigers, Mm. you know, RIP to him, he, before he passed, he wanted to win a World Series at all costs. This was Dombrowski, Miggy, Verlander. He signed, uh, you know, all these guys, and you knew it was like this this team is going to struggle after this run because of how leveraged they were. This is different. This feels like, Every year they're going to be a contender and they're also going to do it the way the Dodgers did and the Rays and build from underneath. So it feels like they're building a foundation and we're living in the penthouse at the same time, which is, again, (laughs) gratitude, tip my cap to the Coens. It's incredible. And, you know, you're also going to see, I think this gets overlooked, you're going to see top prospects come up without the pressure that they've come up with in the past here. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Ahmed Rosario was the top prospect in baseball, just like Francisco Alvarez is right now. Um, He came up having to be the savior. He wasn't ready to be the savior, right? When Francisco Alvarez is asked to be a part of this team, whether it's from the jump this season, whether it's the middle of the season, whether it's next year, he is going to be asked to be the eighth most important guy in that lineup, the ninth most important guy in that lineup. He's not going to have that pressure that um, that a guy, quite frankly, at that young age, generally is not prepared to handle. There are exceptions, right? But more often than not, you're not ready. Think about what you were like at that age, at 20, 21, 22, you know? So I just think there are so many, um, you know, secondary and tertiary benefits to, to doing it this way if you have the resources to do it this way. They've got a lot of flexibility. They're going to be able to bring their prospects along as they see fit. And they're going to be able to be opportunistic in the trade market if there's an element that that you know makes sense for them. So uh yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot to be excited about if you're a Mets fan, right? You now. you nailed it. I wanted to to speak on a point. Uh the lineup, Francisco Alvarez, especially with Correa now, that being another power guy, he doesn't have to be a major cog in this Michael Harris, Vaughn Grissom, those guys, you saw what they could do because they don't have any of pressure on them except to play baseball because the team will not win or lose because of what they did. That's the joy of playing on a contender and being a young position player prospect on the other side of that, being a pitching prospect on a team that contends is the opposite because you have to perform and they want to win. So when you come into a game and there's no, getting your feet wet in the big leagues as a contending team. And so it's easier for the position players, harder for the pitchers. On the other end of that, I came up with Oakland A's where we were terrible when I first got there. And so when I'm pitching and learning how to be a big leaguer, they're like, that doesn't matter anyway. We're going to win 75 games. And so uh, position players, they have to go and perform because their lineup scoring zero runs. And so a guy that's expected to do something eventually feels a lot of pressure. So there's a, there's a give and take. The beautiful part of it is they're with the way they've signed guys at a high AAV that are at an advanced age, they're giving their prospects, their pitching prospects, whatever, whichever ones there are time to get seasoned to, to pitch in AAA, to learn how to pitch. They're not bringing them up to make them pitch. So it's, again, I see the shape of an organization for the future building. It may not work out, but I can see a vision, which is 
we I've said this before, Jolly and I both, it feels safe to be a Mets fan finally. Like again, I, I love the Will Ponds for what they they did for me. I'll forever be grateful. But it's a different feel from an organizational standpoint when Steve Cohen took over. Just different. Yeah. I mean, it's but again, and this is I want to harp on this too. It's different from almost anywhere right now. <laughs> that's a fact. That's yeah. like that is why too. It, it's just when when you ask the question about the atmosphere, like I hope that Mets fans really do come out and show that level of appreciation as much as humanly possible because it is so unique, not just in baseball. It's uh, look at what the, the, he's going to spend a half a billion dollars on payroll this year, or you know, close to it. And a hundred million on penalties. That's yeah, amazing. It's, it's um. There is no guarantee, as you said. This is as close as you could possibly come to a guarantee of contention. Yep. And that's all you can ask for. What more yep. can you ask for? Yeah, it's beautiful. Cool. I think that's all Jolly. I got. Sorry to, to, to hijack the whole that's show. <laughs> no, I'm letting hey, the experts we'll do, do their like, thing. Come on. I'll be the first three-time guest in spring training Hell this year when yeah. you guys come. To the- oh, that would, oh, that would be so- lovely. Hopefully we we'll do that. We'll be in contact for sure because we'll 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 take complete cool. advantage of our relationship. Yeah, we Hell we yeah. also uh, Jerry and I have to show you all the spoils of Port St. Lucie, Jolly. <laughs> oh, really? I've heard yeah, yeah. it's luxurious. <laughs> <laughs> all right, guys, thank you for listening. Go ahead. Way Jerry. better than Vieira, Florida, where we were. Really? Or the Nationals. You know, and I will say, Port St. Lucie, since we first went there for the first time in 2015. Every year gets better and better. That's I think it's heard. smart. Again, when they rebuilt the stadium, they they reinvested in infrastructure. Port St. Lucie, sneaky town now. Yep, yep. All right. We'll hey, see. you guys are selling me on it, all right? You're selling me a little bit. <laughs> Get my hopes up. <laughs> oh. All right. Well, hopefully you got any- we'll connect again in, what, March or February, whatever it is. Uh, that'll got be it. my first Mets spring training ever, hopefully, if it happens. Um, but thank All you guys right, so happen. much for listening, Steve. Thank you again for joining us and being a fantastic, wise guest as you always are. And uh, I'm Anytime. really looking forward to seeing what you do next. I know you get your Rangers are in the swing of things. I'm sorry about your Jets, but it's almost Mets season, baby. It happens. <laughs> <laughs> Is Zach Wilson the guy? No. Okay, oh. that's the answer. Huh? What no. a tough way to end the show. <laughs> no. Uh well, your Rangers looking good. Um, oh, yeah. Is there anything that you got coming on you want to plug? Anything? Thanks, Jerry. I don't even know. No, we've got uh, you know Mets hot stove every Wednesday at six thirty. I think I've got a couple hosting coming up, and of course the great Gary Apple will be. Are you on any of these Mets hot stoves? I'm, I was on the first hot stove, and now I, I've been relegated to BNNY. I think I'll be on tomorrow. Okay. Um, you know, Dave Mandel cracks that whip on. Oh, I know Dave Mandel. <laughs> Dave Mandel has actually already sent me my schedule for 2027. So uh, <laughs> Look at work, so working, working, the, the most organized human being on the planet. Yes. Um, and then we got our final Jets post game show pre and post this weekend. So. Should be a happy one. Should be good. Yeah. Hey, we're having uh, Jay Horowitz on our show. That's a oh. little. You want to you want to leave a message for Jay? We don't have enough time. (laughs) (laughs) That's great. I can't wait. You guys are the best. Tell the missus I said hello. Will do. You guys too. See you later. See you, buddy.